Are you brave enough to be curious? God does not want us just to read his word. He wants us to study his word. This week while I was reading and studying, I came across some very interesting numbers. Do you know that in the Bible, we are only referred to as Christians three times? Only three times does the word Christian show up in the Bible. So do you know how Jesus and how God mainly describes his followers? He uses the word disciple. And the word disciple is used 269 times in the New Testament. So do you know what a disciple is? A disciple is a lifelong learner and follower of Jesus, who also makes lifelong learners and followers of Jesus. And so the point that I'm getting at this morning is, if you're truly going to be a disciple, a learner of Jesus, you need a whole lot more than what I can give you on Sunday mornings in a 30-minute message. Sometimes 35, sometimes 40, but we cut it off at some point, okay? <laughs> you need more than what you're going to get when you show up to church. And so I want to challenge you today to be curious, to ask questions, and I want to give you a very specific challenge this morning. We are going to be talking about a topic today that I can only scratch the surface of. I mean, there is a whole lot more to this topic than what we're going to get through here in Romans chapter 2. And so here's what I want to do. I want to challenge you before we even jump into the message, before we even start, to not just take notes and not just to listen, but at some point in the message, find a question that you might not know the answer to. Write that question down, and then this week, ask somebody else for the answer. Ask somebody, go to another person that you look up to that you think might have the answer. Ask them what that answer is, or study it out for yourself, okay? Because, like I said, we're only going to scratch the surface, and the more questions that we ask, and the more learning that we do, the more we grow, and the more we're able to be the kind of people that God wants us to be, okay? So, that's just a challenge. Now, we're going to jump into the message. Anybody curious about our topic today? I hope you're curious. Come curious, okay? Ready to learn. We're going to be talking about the title of our message this morning is Identity 101. Identity 101. How many of you believe we should know the truth and have our facts straight about our very identity? Go ahead and slip your hand up if you believe that. How many of you believe that we are seeing a major identity crisis happening right in front of our very eyes in the world that we live in today? Man, there's no doubt about it. Now, this is not shocking. It's not shocking because since the fall, since Adam and Eve sinned in the garden and they messed up, all right, since then, we have had a severe case of amnesia. We are literally wandering through life, trying to figure out who we are. And can I tell you this morning, apart from God, we are truly lost. It's not shocking that we see an identity crisis happening in front of us because it's been happening ever since sin came into this world. Can I tell you what is shocking, though? That God wants us back. The Bible tells us that we were created for him. The Bible tells us that we were created in his image and in his likeness. We were created with a God-sized hole in our heart. And even though we have rejected God and even though we have gone our own way, in spite of all of that, God wants us back. And he went to a cross to die for our sins. And guess what our passage is talking about this morning? Our passage this morning is talking about how we can be his. There's no better news in all of the world than that. And what Paul is actually going to be talking about in here is he's going to define in Romans chapter 2 what it means to be a true Jew. Now, this is a big deal because if you study your Bible, you're going to find the Jewish people are a huge part of the entire Old Testament story. They were God's chosen people. And here in Romans chapter 2, Paul is describing what it means to be a true Jew and how anybody can be a true Jew. Now, I don't know about you, but that gets me excited. I think this is awesome. How many of you believe that as human beings, we have some broken, messed up human conditions? Anybody? Anybody? Am I the only one with this? I've got a lot. You can ask my wife. She'll fill you in on a lot of the details. I've got a lot of issues. But one of my broken human conditions is I have, um, I've been diagnosed with what I call, what a lot of people call FOMO, fear of missing out. Anybody struggle with this? When I was young, I'll tell you what, I... I, have to be, I had to be the last one that went to bed. There was no way I was going to go to bed before anybody else because I was not going to wake up the next morning and find out that something fun happened and I missed it. 
Couldn't do it. I, and by the way, when other people are going to bed, I'm like, why are you going to bed? We haven't had enough fun yet. We got to do more stuff. I don't want to miss out on anything. To this day, to this day, if I leave church on a Sunday night or a Wednesday night, because I'm pretty much always the last one to leave on Sunday morning, but if we leave a little bit earlier on Sunday night, and let's just say there's still like maybe five or six cars left in the parking lot, okay? As we pull off campus, you can ask Alana, she will verify this for you. As we pull off campus, I'm always like, I got a tinge in my heart, I'm sad. I just feel like I'm gonna miss out on something. And, I, and I, every time she says it, it's okay, Mike. She tells me that, it's okay. Why does happen to like our church? I like all of you. I think we got some, all, not that she doesn't, that's what she's saying. She's like, don't throw me under the bus, man. I'm not trying to say that. <laughs> she took it that way anyway. She loves you too. <laughs> We all do. I just don't want to miss out on anything. You might be wondering, well, what does that have to do with this message in this passage of Scripture? I've shared this with you before. I will never forget as a kid. I, got, I had the privilege of growing up in church. I got to go to Sunday school in junior church. And I will never forget when the full realization hit me that all I was was a Gentile. I didn't want to be a Gentile. I wanted to be a Jew. The Jews were God's chosen people. The Jews were special to God. And I was just a Gentile. And I remember that hitting me with a ton, like a ton of bricks. Like, but, but no, I, I get it. I'm a Gentile. But I, I can be saved. But I want to be one of God's chosen people. I want to be royalty. I don't want to be part of that history. I don't want to miss out on that. And guess what? We got some incredibly good news today. Everybody can be a true Jew. And even better than that, it gets to the very core of our identity, who God created us to be by nature. And that's what we're going to be looking at today and what we're going to be studying today. So are you ready to dive in? All right. Now, before we get to that, though, Paul lays out some very important things that we've got to see. Okay. So number one this morning is this. If we're going to be understanding the basics about our identity, we've got to know that this we have to know this. Identity is deeper than knowledge. Identity is deeper than knowledge. Now, the, the key verse in understanding all of this goes back to Romans 1, where Paul said, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. And then from there, he laid out the wrath of God and the judgment of God. And we've been talking about those things. And basically, he's, he's getting human beings to understand that our condition as sinners, we are lost and separate from God. And last week in chapter two, we were t he was pretty much referring to people in a very general way, talking to mankind in general, but his underlying target audience all along was the Jewish people, and towards the end of the message, he really started honing in. This message is Paul going straight at the Jews as a whole, but there are so many awesome lessons that we can learn. So where we're starting here in these next few verses that we are going over is Paul is setting them up, okay? So just... This is a setup, and he starts by praising them. He starts by, by giving them eight examples of some incredible things that they had, and he just lists them out, and that's what we're going to go through here, okay? So we're just going to hit these as quick as we can. So verse 17, he says this, first of all, behold, thou art called a Jew. You're called a Jew. You're proud to be called a Jew. You're one of God's chosen people. If we were going to liken it today, if Paul was talking to the church in America today, you know what he would say? You're called a Christian. How many of you are glad to be called a Christian? Isn't it awesome to be associated with Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world? There is no greater association that we could ever have besides that. So you're called a Jew. You're proud to be called a Jew. And then he says next, behold, thou art called a Jew. And the next phrase is, and restest in the law. They were given the law of God. They had confidence in the law of God. They believed that the law of God, the very words of God, was a shield against disaster, and they were 100% right. If we obey this book right here and listen to what it says, it's a shield against disaster. So they found their confidence in the law of God. And then he says, and makest thy boast of God. Not in a bad way, in a good way. Sometimes we hear that word boast and we think always negatively, but not in a bad way. This morning, we were boasting about God. We were singing that choir song, greater, stronger, bigger, greater, stronger. I've been singing it all, better. 
That's right. That's a boast in God. And it's a true boast in God. It's one that God finds delight in. It's one that we all need to understand. There's no obstacle. There's no enemy. There's nothing that our God is not greater than. They found their boast in God. A wonderful thing. And then he says in verse 18, and knowest his will. They know his will. They knew that the most important thing in all the world was to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. They knew the truth of God's word. It says after that, and approvest the things that are more excellent. You didn't just know his will. You approve of his will. Never would a false word be found in their mouth questioning God and his actions and his ways and his judgments. I mean, they truly believe that if God did it and if God said it, it was right. I mean, they were fully convinced. They approved of his will. And then he says at the end of that verse, being instructed out of the law. Oh man, that's, that's a wonderful thing to know God's word. If you've been instructed from this book right here, that is a, a wonderful gift from God. How many of you know, where's Trey Emmons at? Trey, are you in here? Trey's over here. Check out that. Trey, everybody pretty much knows Trey. He's one of our first greeters, one of the first people that, that you meet when you come in here this afternoon. When we get done with this service, he'll be over here at the Next Steps wall. If you're visiting, you're going to go meet Trey, okay? You know one thing that Trey did? He understands. Trey understands the benefits that come from being instructed by the law of God. When he was a senior in high school, he got up here on this stage in front of everybody. And all of our graduates, they have to, say, they have to read their life verse. And his was Psalm 119.99. And he says, got up here and read it. He said, I have more understanding than all my teachers. For my meditation is in thy, for, for in thy testimonies is my meditation. Now listen, I thought that was awesome. It's a pretty epic story right there. But there's truth from that. Honestly, though, when we are instructed from the law, it's not that we go around saying who we're smarter than, but there's wisdom and knowledge that truly does come from the word of God. So they know God's word. And then look at verse 19. And said, And art confident that thou thyself art a guide of the blind, a light of them which are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes. You know what he's saying? You're also confident teachers. You know God's word well enough that you teach it to others. And what you're teaching is not, not wrong. He's not condemning them. You are confident teachers. And then this is the whole reason why is summed up at the end of verse 20. He says, which has the form of knowledge and of the truth in the law. You're a confident teacher because you know why? You do have knowledge and you do have truth. Anything that we know from the word of God is going to be a benefit not only to you, but a benefit to others. And if you're teaching others truths from the God's word, whether you realize it or not, it's an unbelievable blessing that God puts in our lives. We do have knowledge. You do have truth from God's word. Okay, so remember at the start of this, I just said all of this was the setup, right? I've been watching a lot of boxing movies lately, all right? So this is the setup. Here comes a punch, man. This is, but what's coming next is a pretty powerful punch. Look at verse 21. Thou therefore which teachest another, teachest thou not thyself. Oh boy, I have a feeling we're about to go down a dark hole right here. Have you ever been in a situation where like, you know, everything's fine and then somebody says that little dig and all of a sudden it gets really tight in that room and you're like, how do I get out of here as quick as I can? I don't want to be in the middle of this. This is about what's happening here. I mean, he sets them up beautifully. He brags about all the things that they had going right in their life, and they were truly right about all of those things. I mean, they were doing right even in the fact that they were teaching others. I, I talked about being a disciple. A disciple isn't just a lifelong learner. A disciple teaches others. God wants us to take the knowledge that we have, and he wants us to use it in the lives of others and to be instructors and to teach others after we have taught ourselves. So not only is knowledge awesome, but knowledge is for me. Your true identity, this is where it's all going. Your true identity is deeper than what you know. It's who you actually are. We're getting all the way down to the heart of the matter. It's not just about our head knowledge. It's who we are. It's how we act. It's who we are inside, who we are in the very core of our being. And Paul gives them Three powerful questions that really just sets them up right after that. If we look at verse 21 in the middle. He says, Thou therefore which teachest another, teachest thou not thyself. Then he says, 
Thou that preachest, a man should not steal. Dost thou steal? Verse 22. Thou that sayest, a man should not commit adultery. Everybody read that question with me, okay? Dost thou commit adultery? Thou that abhorrest idols. Read this question out loud with me. Dost thou commit sacrilege? Three powerful questions right there. We're going to ask them to ourselves as we go through this. Paul's not just asking them. He's really asking all of us. The Word of God is practical for every, for every scenario of life, for all people. So, have you ever stolen? You might be sitting here thinking right off the bat, man, I'm no thief. I'm the furthest thing from a thief. Have you ever stolen? Did you ever steal when you were a kid? Did you ever take your friend's toy at recess or all the way back to the nursery? Have you ever cheated on a test? Have you ever cheated on your taxes? Oh, boy, I should probably stay away from that one. Have you... Ladies, have you ever uh, used someone else's recipe but claimed it as your own? I mean, that's a form of cheating right there. There's all kinds of ways that we could go with this, right? That just reveal the fact that if we're honest, we've all been guilty at some point or another in our life of, of stealing. Have you committed adultery? Well, that's a powerful question. Again, I know our, our initial thought would be, I would never think of doing such a thing. But the Bible, Jesus himself said, you miss the whole point of the spirit of the law. It's not just if, whether or not you've actually committed the physical act of adultery. If you look on a woman to lust after her, you're guilty of adultery. Man, that, that hits to the core. And I'll say, I don't think even in our society today, you can't just put that all on men. It can be the reverse is true too for women as well. It doesn't matter if we look and we lust and we think impure thoughts, we're just as guilty of adultery by God's standards. And then he says, have you committed idolatry? Again, the initial reaction is, how dare you? Especially when you think about the Jewish people. They abhorred idolatry. They understood the damage that idolatry had done in their past by the time Jesus shows up on their scene. They're not struggling anymore with worshiping idols and bowing down. They hated anybody that worshiped idols. They understood the danger and the wickedness of that. But yet, how many times are we guilty of not putting God first in our lives? How many times do our hearts get steered in other directions where we love other things, love other people? We make idols in our lives that we love more than we truly love the Lord our God with all of our heart, our soul, our mind, and our strength. And Paul says in verse 24, he says, uh, in verse 23, thou that makest thy boast of the law through breaking the law dishonorest thou God. He's setting them up because he's just saying, if you were to understand committing adultery, committing idolatry, committing theft, stealing in the strictest, most radical way, that the way that Jesus teaches it, there's not a single person that's not guilty of breaking all three. And here he's saying in verse 23, hey, you make your boast of the law. But yet, through breaking the law, you dishonor God. Wow. Now, here's the knockout blow. All right, so he set him up. He gave him a good, hard punch. Now he's just going he's to, he's finishing it off. This is a knockout blow. Look at verse 24. For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you, as it is written. The first point that Paul clearly emphasizes that he wants to get across is that, yeah, you have knowledge, and that's great. It's wonderful what you know. But knowledge minus obedience equals blasphemy. Knowledge minus obedience equals blasphemy. God doesn't care what we know. He cares what we do. He cares about who we are. All of you, when you hear the word hypocrite, you know what you think? It's somebody who doesn't practice what they preach. And that's exactly what the Jewish people had become. They had all the knowledge. They knew all the right things to say. They knew all the right things to teach. But in their heart of hearts, they were as far and cold from God as you could possibly get. And guess what? They weren't fooling anybody. By the time Jesus showed up on the scene, the Jewish people wanted nothing to do with their religious leaders, with the Pharisees, with the Sadducees, because they saw right through it. They saw right down to the hypocrisy and they were blaspheming the very name of God. Yeah, you claim to be God's people, but you act nothing like him. And as a result, the world is running away from God. Do we have the same problem in America today? Man, how many people call themselves Christians? Man, there's a ton of people that you'll find. I'm a Christian, 
But yet the second you look at their life and you go any deeper, you see quickly that there's really not evidence. There's really not the right actions that are backing that up. And we have a plague in our society today where people are running away from God and they're running away from the church and there's a lack of trust in the church. And can I tell you, it's not God's problem. That's our problem as believers. We can have all the knowledge in the world, but if we're not obedient, we're nothing but blasphemers. Man, you know what we got to do? We got to make sure we're examining our own hearts and our own lives. Identity, true identity in Christ goes deeper than what we know in our heads. Secondly, I want us to see this morning that identity is deeper than knowledge, but secondly, it also, identity transcends the physical. Identity transcends the physical. Now, in verses 25 through 28, we are going to come across, actually all through the rest of this, a big word called circumcision. And I want you to understand why this was so important. Circumcision was part of their very identity. All right, circumcision was a physical sign that God had committed himself to be the God of Israel. It was the sign of the covenant, and it was a physical sign. What's amazing is that God chose to be associated with the nation of Israel, and he chose the nation of Israel to be associated with him. This was a privilege that was unique only to the nation of Israel. No other nation on earth has ever had that unique uh, privilege or position or will ever have it, okay? It was a literal nation. It still exists today. God still has plans for the nation of Israel. And so here's the point. Circumcision was that physical sign, and to the people... To the Jewish people, it was a, phys- a physical reminder that me and my seed after me are a people that are wholly consecrated to God. Man, when you were born a, a Jewish person, a Jewish young man, you were circumcised on the eighth day. If you were to be converted to Judaism, even as an adult, you would have to go through the process of circumcision. Here's all that I want you to understand. To be a Jew is to be circumcised. To be circumcised is to be a Jew. This was their very identity. This was their very identity. Now look at what Paul says in verse 25. It just keeps getting sharper and sharper as we go along. For circumcision verily profiteth. There's a profit in circumcision. It's important. If thou keep the law, if you obey the law, there's there's a profit to circumcision. But look what he says next. But if thou be a breaker of the law, Thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. Didn't Paul just get done telling them that they were breakers of the law? He just got done setting them up on that. And now you know what he's saying? He's saying one of the worst things that you could possibly say to a Jewish person at that time. Your circumcision means nothing. Imagine it being like today. Just the fact that you call yourself Christian means nothing. Your Christianity means nothing. That's essentially what he's saying right here. I mean, those are fighting words. He goes even further in verse 26. Therefore, if the uncircumcision keep the righteousness of the law, shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision? Oh boy, the Jewish people did not always look highly, and this was not God's intention. This was their own wicked hearts, one of the signs that they weren't truly the kind of people that God wanted them to be. They looked down on Gentiles. They looked down on them as dogs. They saw themselves as being better than the world that was around them. And here what Paul's saying is, the uncircumcised that you look down on, if they obey the righteousness of the law, they're actually circumcised. They're more circumcised than you are. Look what he says then in the next verse. He goes even further. And shall not uncircumcision, which is by nature, if it fulfill the law. (laughs) What are those next two words? Everybody say those out loud with me. Ready? What's it say? Judge thee who by the letter of circumcision does transgress the law. (laughs) Not only are the uncircumcised, if they obey the righteousness of the law, really circumcised, then guess what they're going to do? The uncircumcised are going to judge you. Even though you, keep, you. even though you have the outward appearance, you have the law, and you have the physical reminder of circumcision, none of that means nothing. And those who are not circumcised, who truly obey the righteousness of the law, they're going to judge you one day. And now... Verse 28, he, jumps all, he dumps all the fuel on the fire, and look what he says. For he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. Not only was he telling them that their circumcision meant nothing, he just said that circumcision 
minus obedience equals uncircumcision. Okay? This is the second point. Circumcision minus obedience equals uncircumcision. And he just basically said, you're not a true Jew. Now, imagine this in our world today. Okay? Paul was attacking their very identity. He was attacking their very identity. Imagine it like this. Your identity is not Indian. Your identity is not Asian. Amer Asian. It's not American. It's not African American. It's not Hispanic. It's not red, yellow, black, or white. How many of you believe those would be fighting words if you said that to some people? How about your identity is not, is not male. It's not female. It's not lesbian. It's not gay. It's not transgender. Those things, that's not your identity. Okay, it's not mother, it's not father, it's not business owner, it's not pastor, it's not police officer, it's not teacher, it's none of those things. Those are not our identity. That's, that's essentially what he's saying. He's attacking the very core of who they believe they were. And he goes a step further. He's not just attacking their identity, he's also attacking their very faith. The Jewish people were some of the most devout religious people that you will ever find in this entire world, even still to this day. They are devout. They are sincere. And you know what he's saying? It doesn't matter if you're a Jew. It doesn't matter if you're a Muslim. It doesn't matter if you're Catholic. It doesn't matter if you're Mormon. It doesn't matter if you're Pentecostal. It doesn't matter if you're Methodist. It doesn't matter if you're Lutheran. And it doesn't even matter if you call yourself a big capital B Baptist. We're in a Baptist church. Those things don't matter. Your identity transcends the physical. There's something greater and deeper at stake. And what he wants us all to see and understand this morning is we must see past the physical. We've got to see past the outward. We've got to see past those outward appearances because what God's interested in is something much deeper, much more impactful, much more meaningful. And thankfully, he doesn't leave us hanging there, okay? Verse 29 sums it all up. The last thing that we got to see, not only is identity not about what we know, and not only does identity transcend the physical, but identity is found in the spirit. Look at verse 29. But he is a Jew, which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men but of God. I just got done saying that circumcision means nothing. Well, Paul follows that right back up, though, and he says, no, circumcision means everything. Circumcision absolutely does mean everything. Verse 29, he starts off, he says, but he is a Jew, which is one inwardly. Being a Jew matters. Remember, we set this up. Everybody can be a true Jew, being a true Jew matters. You get to be one of God's chosen people. Hey, the Jewish people were given the word of God. The Jewish people were given the promises of God. The Jewish people were given the Messiah, Jesus Christ himself. Everybody here, every person that's ever been born, when they find out about who Jesus is, should want to be a true Jew, should want to be a true child of God because salvation itself belongs to the Jews. And this is where he's going with that. He is a Jew. This is a big deal. This is something that ought to pique our interest, ought to get our attention. And then he says, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter. What God is looking for is something entirely different than who you are by physical birth and outward actions. And how many people can say a huge amen to that? Oh, the answer is not in who we are, are physically, who we are born. And I, I am so glad because we are born broken sinners. And there are people that are born into messed up family situations, messed up homes. And if our identity was in who we were physically, we would be hopeless. We would be far from Christ. We, we, we would... We would be desperately doing what the world is doing, which is searching for anywhere that they can find meaning. That's why we have that identity crisis that's happening today. What God is looking for goes beyond who we are physically. It goes beyond what we do outwardly. 
Circumcision means everything. It absolutely matters because God is looking for a circumcision that is deep. It's inward and it is a complete transformation of the heart. What we need is not just to be better versions of ourselves. What we need is to be completely transformed into the image and likeness of Christ. What this world needs is not more good people. What this world needs is Jesus and they need to see transformed Christians who are living that out every single day of their lives where the power of God, the gospel that is the power of God into salvation is evident in the way that it is transforming and changing every single thing about us. And the point of this whole message, uncircumcision plus obedience equals circumcision. Now you might notice a word in there. Uncircumcision plus what? Obedience. I feel like we've been beating a dead horse with this thing. (laughs) I mean, we ended the book of Joshua. It's obedience. We come into the book of Romans, and Paul says, I was given this gift of apostleship for the obedience to the faith. And here we are back again at obedience to the law. Paul's not saying that it doesn't matter just because you can't keep the law. That doesn't mean that the law is not important. Obedience matters. Everything has built to this point. In verse 26, he said, therefore, if the circumcision keep the righteousness of the law. I mean, if the uncircumcision keep the righteousness of the law. In verse 27, he said, and shall not uncircumcision, which is by nature, if it fulfill the law, our obedience absolutely matters. Now, I'm thankful that It's not about the letter of the law, but it's about the spirit of the law. You see both of those things there. You see the spirit in verse 29, and then you say, not according to the letter. It's never been about the letter of the law. God knows who we are as human beings, and he knows that we're never going to be able to completely be obedient and fulfill the law of Christ. But what he cares about is that we humble ourselves and that we recognize that we're in desperate need of help. We need someone greater and bigger than ourselves so we can please God and we can have a right relationship with God. And because of the gospel, which is the power of God unto salvation, we have hope. And here's how it happens. It happens through the Spirit. It happens through the Spirit. Um, I stole this from somebody, just so you all know. Okay, I'll give credit to where credit is due. This was not an idea that was original to me, but I was reading, and he's like, take out a piece of paper, write God at the top, write you at the bottom, your heart to represent you, write law in the middle. So go ahead and put that up there. Here we go. So I got some professionals to help me out because I can't draw very good. But here's the idea. You have God, and then you have us represented by the heart. You have you. Okay, make this personal. It's me. It's you. But standing between us and God is the law. Now, that's a major problem because the Bible tells us that all are unrighteous. Even our filthiness, I mean, even our righteousness is as filthy rags is what the Bible tells us. We cannot obey the law. The New Testament tells us that the law, the, old, the Ten Commandments, let's just make it simple like that, the Ten Commandments. If we don't obey the Ten Commandments, we are unrighteous. And the law is our schoolmaster to show us that we need a Savior, that we need somebody outside of ourselves to step in and intervene because no matter how hard we try, we're always going to fall short. So the law, by the way, the law is Satan's biggest weapon. He's an accuser of the brethren. He stands before God and he accuses us night and day. He accuses you in your own mind. How many times has Satan come along and beat you up and said, you're nothing but a filthy, rotten sinner. You can never amount to being anything that God wants you to be. And how many times does he keep us in our sin because he's a good accuser and we know that we are guilty because of the law, right? Man, we got a major obstacle between us and God. But you know what the law was designed for? The aim of the law was not to keep us from God, but the aim of the law was to bring us to God. And guess what happened? Jesus bridged that gap. Go ahead and put the cross on there. You've got to understand this. Jesus came and he fulfilled the law. He lived a sinless, righteous, perfect life. And the only penalty that would be sufficient to pay for sin was a sinless, perfect sacrifice. And when Jesus went to the cross, he went as the spotless lamb of God. He went completely pure and righteous, and he became sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. When it talks about the, the, the gospel being the power of God to salvation, because Jesus died, was buried, and he rose again. 
When God looks at us, when we put our faith and trust in him, when he looks at us, he sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ. How many of you believe getting the righteousness of Jesus Christ into your identity as a human being will make a tremendous difference in your heart and life? Okay, so Jesus, he paid for the law and he bridges the gap. But we still have a problem, right? Because even after we believe in him, we don't instantly become cured and we don't no longer have a sinful nature, right? We still have a sinful nature. So you know what happens? The spirit of God. The Bible says when you believe in Jesus, you are sealed with the Holy Spirit of God. And he comes and he takes up residence in your life. And you know what he does? He takes that law and he writes it into our hearts. Go ahead and put that arrow up. That arrow is just a representation of the Holy Spirit. This is all invisible. You can't see this, but this is exactly what's happening. Ezekiel gives us a perfect example of it. Go ahead and put those verses up on the screen. I just want to read them to everybody. This is what was promised in the Old Testament. A new heart also will I give you. How many of you thank God for that? A new heart. I want a new heart. I, I, my heart needs to be transformed every day. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. You know what he's saying? You have a hard heart. You have a stony heart. That's how we're born into this world. We are born dead in our trespasses and sins. And what he wants to do is he wants to take away our hard hearts and he wants to give us a new heart, a heart that is a heart of flesh, a heart that is tender and soft towards God. And he says in the next verse, a new, uh, and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you shall keep my judgments and do them. Because remember, what's the purpose of the law? The purpose of the law is to bring us into a right relationship with God. So go back to that last picture and put that last arrow up. What happens is when we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit comes and lives inside of us and he writes the law of God. He takes our stony, hard heart and he makes it soft and tender in a new heart that is soft and tender towards God. And then the Holy Spirit then puts that law in our hearts and he takes us to a right relationship with God. He enables us to live a righteous life. We are not able in and of ourselves. We are sinners that fall short of God's glory. But you know what? The Spirit of God truly does change everything. Because when we put our faith and trust in Him, we get a new heart. And it doesn't mean that we're perfect. And it doesn't mean that we're always going to do what's right every single day of our lives. But it means... That now we have the opportunity to live a life in obedience to his word that truly does please God in every single area and aspect of our lives. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. When you trust Jesus as your savior, your identity, you become a true Jew, a true, true child of God that is circumcised in the heart. And with the law of God written in our heart and a desire to obey him. Think about how this truly does change everything. Paul was attacking their very identity, right, for a while. And he was saying, you're not a true Jew. And he was going at that. But he turns it all back around because that's what the gospel does. It transforms everything. You know what I love about our church? There are multiple ethnicities that are represented here this morning. And I love it. I pray that our church would be a church that is a more of an accurate representation of heaven, that it's not a church that's just filled with a bunch of white people, but that there's people from every kindred, tribe, tongue, and nation. I, I want our church to be a reflection of our community. If our community is 10% African-American, then our church should be 10% that. If it's 8% Hispanic, whatever the case may be, our church should be an accurate reflection of this community because you know what? Yes, your race and your ethnicity, it does matter. It's part of who God made you, and it's part of who God designed you to be. But we cannot let the world dictate to us how we should view one another and how we should treat one another because it goes deeper than that. God sees us all as his children, and he wants to take the beauty of that, and he wants to put it together, and he wants there to be unity. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. And the church should be a representation of what this world is desperately looking for in all of its race and culture wars. And our identity matters, but the spirit changes everything. And once we have the right heart to please God, then we view our race and our physical identity through that lens. There are a lot of 
Men and women here today, guess what? You are one or the other. That's the only two options of people that are here. You're either a man or you're a woman. And I say that because guess what? Again, there's a major identity crisis that is happening in our world when it comes to those two very basic common sense terms. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that there is a difference between a man and a woman. You know what God calls us to do? Be everything that God created you to be as a man and embrace it. Be everything that God created you to be as a woman and embrace it. There is a biblical femininity that is absolutely beautiful and different from the way that this world describes femininity. There is an absolutely beautiful masculinity that is found in the Bible that is different from the way that this world presents masculinity. And when I was talking about being curious and a topic like this only scratching the surface go deeper and find out what God says it means to be a woman find out what God says it means to be a man find out how that should affect your marriage and your home and your relationships and who you are at the very core let God take your heart of stone and change it into a heart of flesh hey use your career I said earlier that it doesn't matter. My identity is not in the fact that I'm a pastor. My identity is in the fact that I am in a child of God. But guess what? He called me to be a pastor. So through that, I get to point people to what it's all about. It's Jesus. And you can do the same thing as a teacher, as a police officer, in your business, whatever it is, as a father, as a mother, as a son, as a friend, as a brother, whatever title you give yourself, whatever title someone else calls you, look at that through the lens of what the Holy Spirit has done in your heart and live out the law of God. Find out what he says he wants you to be and then do it in that you will find that not only are you a true Jew, but you are finding your identity in every single area and aspect of your life.